Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. My guest today is Robert Epstein, who is a senior research psychologist at the American Institute for Behavioral Research and Technology in California. He's the author of 15 books and the former editor-in-chief of Psychology Today. His books include Teen 2.0, Saving Our Children and Families from the Torment of Adolescence, and Passing the Turing Test, Philosophical and Methodological Issues in the Quest for Thinking Computers. He's going to talk to us today about the brain as a computer and how that metaphor is not only incorrect, but unhelpful. Hello, Robert. Welcome to the Middleway Society podcast. Well, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure. Okay, well, the reason I contacted you for this interview is because you've recently written an article for Aeon magazine entitled The Empty Brain, Your Brain Does Not Process Information, Retrieve Knowledge or Store Memories. In short, your brain is not a computer. Now, I'll provide a link for this for any listeners wanting to uh, read the article. But first of all, what was it that prompted you to write it, Robert? It's something I've been thinking about for a long, long time. Um, I mean, at least 20 years. I've been programming since I was 13, so that's uh, that's quite a long time. That's that's almost 50 years. Yeah. And it has just bothered me uh, more and more uh, in recent decades, uh, the fact that uh, so many experts in so many fields have come to speak about the functioning of the brain, in other words, the functioning of human beings, uh, as if we are computers, and have uh, looked at the brain as if it is a computer, or at least an information processing system. Uh, and I know without doubt that that is incorrect. It is not even slightly correct. So uh, it finally just uh, it just came to a head. I just felt I really needed to, uh, to 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 write this down and share my views with others. And I'm and I'm completely shocked by uh, the uh, the reception. Quite shocked. In what way? In what way are you shocked? Well, I, I this this issue was somewhat esoteric, but. Uh, and therefore that not many people would be interested in what I wrote. But at this moment in time, I, I understand that we've passed 500,000 views and we've passed 80,000 shares on Facebook. And uh, the day they posted this article, that Aeon Magazine posted it, uh, it crashed their website, which is a first for me and for uh, the magazine. Wow. Okay, well, let's um, let's dive in then, um, Robert. You argue that that flawed metaphors about the brain and human intelligence have a, a very long history. Well, yes, uh, obviously, there's something remarkable about uh, our intelligence, and uh, therefore, uh, practically as long as people could speak, uh, it, it appears that they have been. Uh, speculating about our intelligence and where it comes from and why we're uh, so very different from, you know, uh, others in the animal kingdom and uh, from all other animals, obviously. And the, there have been various metaphors uh, proposed over the years, uh, which uh, grammatically appear to explain our intelligence. I emphasize grammatically, but it, which, in fact, uh, don't explain it at all. Uh, the the earliest one was the notion that uh, that at conception or at birth we are infused with a with a spirit of some sort, uh, a holy spirit or some other spirit, and so we're intelligent because the spirit is. So uh, the, there you go. So grammatically, you see, we've explained it because uh, the word because is in the sentence. We're intelligent uh, because the spirit is intelligent that has, in, that has infused us. And, uh, and really, uh, you know, that, that was a very, very, uh, powerful idea. It still is to many people around the world. And, um, uh, and that really has stuck around for thousands of years, that particular idea. But over time, other, uh, metaphors were introduced. They tended to have to do with the, the, the technology of the time. So, um, 
you know, again, several thousand years ago, at some point, uh, there was a, a great deal done with, with, with water, with aqueducts and, uh, and with fluids. And, uh, and, and we saw the beginnings of a fluid metaphor of intelligence. The fact that our brain is quite, quite wet, uh, probably helped that metaphor. Uh, and that metaphor also stuck around for a very long time. So, uh, you know, even, um, in much of the world, particularly in Europe, uh, diseases were being treated by uh, methods such as bloodletting. Uh, the notion that, that liquid humors, uh, uh, you know, accounted for disease. Well, that was very powerful. And the idea that flu these fluids somehow were uh, responsible for our intelligence, that was part of the story. But of course, it's just a story. So the stories continue. They go on and on to mecha mechanical uh, uh, ideas and so on. And then finally, in the 1940s, when computers are invented, uh, in large part with the help of a very brilliant uh, Englishman uh, named Alan Turing, yeah. Uh, uh, not long after, I mean, and this should be, should come as no surprise to anybody, but not long after, uh, in the early fifties, mid fifties, uh, the notion that, <clears throat> that we're intelligent because the brain works like a computer, uh, was introduced first by a man named uh, Miller, an American psychologist, and then by a, again, one of the early computer pioneers, von Neumann. Uh, and this, uh, this idea really has caught on and has, and has really propelled thinking and research in multiple fields. And it has even impacted the way, uh, lay people talk about intelligence and the brain. So we talk about ourselves as, you know, retrieving ideas and storing things and processing information. And that's even just become part of, of the vernacular. So, uh, yeah, the, metaphor, the metaphors are, I have been around for a long time because the brain is, uh, it's the most complicated thing we've ever tried to study. Uh, and the computer metaphor is, has really, really taken on a tremendous, uh, uh, life. Uh, and at this point, and I do not exaggerate in both Europe and the U.S., that metaphor uh, is behind Literally billions of euros, billions of dollars in funding uh, are being spent because of that metaphor. They're tied very closely to that metaphor. And that, I think, is outrageous. You, you, in the article, you use a metaphor yourself that we have an empty brain. How is that um, more adequate than the, the computer um, metaphor? <laughs> okay, well, the empty brain, <clears throat> that's a title. And... Uh, <laughs> I, I, I did not come up with that title, but I, but I have to say I do love it. I love the title. And that was an editor, uh, you know, at Aon Magazine. And that's what editors do. Editors put titles on things. Uh, cause I'm a magazine editor myself. So I know how this works because I work with Scientific American. And before that, I was editor in chief of psychology today. So, uh, you know, editors put titles on things so that, to attract readers. Yeah. Uh, but I, I disavow the title immediately at the beginning of the article. I point out the brain is far from empty. Uh, that in fact, we, we are uh, certainly equipped. Our, uh, our brains are equipped with all kinds of, uh, remarkable abilities, uh, you know, even at birth. Uh, the most important one being the, our ability to learn. So, you know, the brain is built, uh, in, in a way that allows it to change, uh, in an orderly, way as as a result of experience so it changes and it's built to change and it changes in an orderly way as a result of experience so it's not empty yeah uh, but what i'm trying to do though is is get us away from uh from the computer metaphor or any metaphor for that matter because a metaphor is a story it's just a story it doesn't it, it's it's something you you it, you use out of desperation uh, when you don't really understand, uh, you know, how the mechanism works or how this, this lump of, uh, of neurons and so on, how it works, then we, we invent stories and that's all it is. And it's a really, it's a fundamentally, uh, very silly story, very, very weak story because we're, we, we work nothing like computers work. Nothing. Imagine you were trying to explain what the brain does to say a seven year old kid. How would you, how would you get across roughly? what the brain does 
Well, the most you can tell a, a, a seven-year-old is, uh, is something about the, uh, the anatomy. You can talk about uh, certain unusual kinds of cells that we don't see in the rest of the body, such as the neuron. Uh, we can, you can talk about the fact that, uh, that neurons do, uh, are again very unusual in that they're, uh, you know, part of, uh, of an elaborate electrochemical system, uh, that they do in fact, uh, 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 build up a kind of a charge and then they discharge. That's called an action potential. I mean, there, there are lots of things you can say, uh, you know, but all of these things turns out when it comes to intelligence are quite superficial. Yeah. And and but when I say they're superficial, all these wonderful things you could say to a seven year old, they're quite superficial because no one on the planet has the slightest idea how these characteristics of the brain have anything to do with our intelligence. So uh, to give you the, an example from from my article, something as simple as uh, uh, the melody of a symphony, let's say Beethoven's fifth, uh, you know, we have no idea how it is, having listened to Beethoven's fifth, how it is sometime later uh, we're able to, you know, to to hum Beethoven's fifth. No one has any idea how that occurs. Uh, again, the computer metaphor, of course, says that somehow we we store a representation of the melody in our brain. Uh, but you see, it's there is nothing stored in the brain there's no information stored in the brain period and there's certain and, and and neuroscientists could look for a thousand years they will never find in any form anything like beethoven's fifth symphony any any representation of it <clears throat> will never be found in the brain never we don't work that way so just to sort of summarize that so so this representational view of things which you find not only in science, but, you know, it has a long history in philosophy, too, that you're having a sort of picture in your mind of what is the case beyond your mind and is deeply flawed. It is deeply flawed, yes. You see, now, before there were computers, uh, the this, this storage metaphor still existed. It, it, it always it has existed uh, with respect to some, some sort of uh, technology of whatever era we're talking about. So for, at one point, there, there was a kind of library metaphor used, for example, still the notion of storage. Yeah. Uh, you know, even though the word information wasn't used necessarily. But uh, yes, this idea that representations of the world somehow, uh, you know, get stored in us is a very powerful idea. There, there is no evidence that, uh, that any representations exist. And what I'm saying is, uh, if we begin to realize that we, we are in fact, organisms are part of the natural world uh, that you have to consider other possibilities. And the, and, uh, the simplest possibility, which I uh, try to explain in the article, um, the simplest possibility is, is simply that there is orderly change. Yeah. Now, if, you, if, you've got, if you've got that notion of orderly change, uh, then you don't need uh, the, the idea of representation at all. Uh, because, uh, when, when in fact, uh, I, I listen to a symphony and I, uh, I, I, I hum back as best I can, I hum back the melody, uh, you know, the, the evidence that I know something about this, uh, the symphony is that in the future, uh, I might be able to hum it back again. Uh, that in the future, if someone asks me to hum the melody of Beethoven's fifth, uh, in fact, I will do it reasonably well, but I can do this without s having stored anything, and I can do it without having retrieved anything. All that had to have occurred is that I, my brain changed in some orderly way, uh, having had the experience, uh, and now I'm, as a result, I can now hum a melody uh, reasonably well. I keep emphasizing reasonably well because, you know, <laughs> What, whatever the heck is going on in there, uh, it, it doesn't work that well. It's nothing like a computer in the sense that a computer t actually takes a representation of a stimulus and actually stores it, and it doesn't deteriorate or anything. It doesn't change. Just stay, and then it moves it around, and then at some point or other, it, it can retrieve it and give it back to you exactly as it stored it. Yeah. So that's that's why I keep saying regarding whatever it is we do, we do it 
reasonably well, or in fact, in many, many cases, very poorly. Uh, not only that, uh, if, if say, you, re- you, you tell me a story and ask me to repeat back the story immediately, I will repeat it back differently than you said it. Chinese whispers. Yes. If you ask me to repeat it back a week later, uh, I'll repeat it back even more poorly. And if you ask me a year from now, even more poorly, and so on. And so uh, another famous Englishman, wrote a, a, a book about this called Remembering. This is Sir Frederick Bartlett. Yeah. Uh, it was published in the 1930s. And this is exactly what he did. He, he, uh, he told people a story and, uh, and, and asked them to repeat it back after varying delays, sometimes after delays of years. And it's just marvelous. I mean, uh, uh, what happens is uh, exactly what we know would happen, which is that uh, you repeat it back immediately you know, fairly poorly, and then a week later it's worse, and then a year later it's much worse. And I think he he went as far as 10 years, at which point people could come up with, you know, the topic of the story, maybe a couple of details and that's it, but the thread, the actual plot was completely gone. Uh, so whatever it is that we do, we, we don't do it anything like a computer, and we do it kind of very imperfectly. So all you need is the notion of orderly change. Yeah. Now, how many neurons are involved? Which neurons are? It could be it could be twelve neurons that are involved. It could be twelve million. It could be twelve billion. You know, and and, and in fact, there is some evidence uh, from research on the brain uh, that you know even very simple you know trying to trying to recall very simple things from our past sometimes seems to involve many hundreds of millions of neurons. Yeah. So what, whatever the, the change is, it might not be simple. It might be very complicated. Now, I also introduce something which I think is quite important and which I've not seen people talk about very much, uh, and it's what I call the uniqueness problem. And to me, this is the heart of my, of my essay, although I, I've not seen people paying much attention to this, which is a shame because this really is the heart of it. Once you realize that all we need to talk about is orderly change, and that's all we need, oh, now we have a problem because, you see, it, it's very likely that when you listen to Beethoven's fifth, your brain changes in some way, then I listen to Beethoven's fifth, it's quite likely that my brain changes in a completely yeah. different way. Because you see what's happening is, uh, you know, you're bringing to bear on that situation your brain, which has a, its own history. And so when you listen, you're listening to different things than I would listen to perhaps. And uh, you have different knowledge of music. So you might think of it in a different way as you're listening. You have a whole different perspective yeah, on the yeah. music. Uh, maybe you know something about, uh, you know, the theory of chords, you know, that I don't know anything yeah. about. And so, so the fact is, what happens in your brain when you listen is almost certainly completely different than what happens in my brain. Sure. Yeah. Now we have now we have a very big problem because this makes us unique, not only uh, genetically, which is interesting, of course, but this makes our brains absolutely unique. And it means there's no possible way. Uh, that you could scan a brain and extract information from it, as we see in the movies. It means there's no possible way we could download the contents of a brain into a computer and live forever, as my old friend Ray Kurzweil thinks one can do. And um, there's just no possible way. I mean, we are what we are, yeah, which yeah. is, uh, and what we are, and what we are is fascinating and marvelous and wonderful. No, I, I, I very much agree with that, uh, Robert. And it, it makes me think of something like poetry and I think poetry is a great way to cultivate a tolerance of ambiguity because as you say when we ever listen to something read something like that we bring our own experience into the mix it's a sort of interaction between the and that that, you could say that for all art really couldn't you absolutely well every everything that happens to us moment to moment in time we're bringing to bear our experience yeah and so we are we are paying attention to uh, we are attending to different elements of what's occurring, uh, and we are uh, uh, we are changing in a way that has to do with uh, what we're paying attention to, and we're changing in a way that has to do with our background, our knowledge, 
uh, and so on. So and then so now that we've changed as a result of this new experience, having listened to Beethoven's Fifth being performed by a great symphony, uh, the fact is whatever <laughs> whatever has whatever state we're now in also keeps changing. Yeah, it it, it, great, it never stops. It never stops. So that what you know whatever it is we we got from that one experience that we just had a few minutes ago. It doesn't, it doesn't, in a way, it doesn't even matter because it's constantly subject to further change. The process never stops. And of course, when the system starts to deteriorate, which is inevitable, it happens with all of us, then we lose, we're not losing memories, you see. We're, we're just losing the ability to, uh, to, to re-experience our past. I think that's when when we use the the memory metaphor I think really that's what we're talking about generally generally speaking we're saying that we can rehear something even though it's absent yeah we can rehear it to some extent now that we can rehear it we can now reproduce it to some extent well as the brain det- deteriorates we're able less and less to be able to re-experience uh you know our past and therefore, we lose more and more of our past. And of course, over time, we even lose more and more of our own identity. Uh, and I, I, and I think, I think that this, this, this process, in a way, to me, it's just beautiful. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, you know, I, I'm not saying I'm looking forward to deteriorating. I'm just saying that, that the process is extraordinary right from the outset and it's incredibly complex. And to me, it's utterly beautiful. And I think we should try to understand it for what it is. Yeah, no, I agree. We're not robots, aren't we? Um, anyway, just yeah. uh, two more questions, um, Robert. In, in many ways, not any of this stuff is new. Arguably, the, the digital computer analogy started falling apart in the 80s with sort of parallel distributed processing and neural network architectures. I'm, I'm thinking of Francisco Varela here. And then came embodied cognition in the 90s. And then also John Searle's Chinese room thought experiment in philosophy. And you, and you also talk in the article about the more recent work of the cognitive scientist Anthony Chimero that completely rejects the view that human brains work like a computer. However, despite all the evidence to the contrary, it's still very, very pervasive, not only on the street, but still very much in the, in the sciences. So what, what is it that makes it so sticky, this metaphor? Uh, I think the reason why this metaphor is so sticky uh, is because of a uh, of a faulty syllogism. Now, people are turning up who are criticizing me uh, here and, and, and saying that, no, it's not true. But I, I, I really think this syllogism is is there in the background, uh, largely unexamined. Uh, and, and the syllogism, as all syllogisms do, has three parts. And the first part is uh, that all computers are capable of behaving intelligently. And I think that's reasonable to say. And I think that that's what makes the computer so remarkable an invention. And that's what makes it different from something like a can opener uh, in that all computers can be programmed in a way so that they behave somewhat intelligently, in fact, somewhat like humans behave. So there's number one. Number two is that all computers are, in fact, information processors. It doesn't matter what kind of architecture they use. And of course, the vast majority of computers ever built only use uh, one kind of architecture, which is uh, just a, it's all digital, uh, it, generally speaking, non-parallel, uh, you know, kind of linear in function. And they all use roughly the same. There are a few newer kinds that have slightly different architecture, but it, it, it's, that's irrelevant. They're still all information processors. They all still... Uh, uh, they, they create representations of uh, numbers and letters and so on, and then they store those and then they manipulate those and then they retrieve and they, they all do that. So, uh, so now we've got pieces of the syllogism. Uh, and the third one is, uh, therefore, and this is the faulty conclusion, therefore, all entities that are capable of behaving intelligently are information processors. And I, and I honestly believe that's the underlying problem here. That's what makes this notion so sticky. Uh, and of course, that that syllogism is faulty. If you if you make some some lovely little Venn diagrams, uh, you can show uh, show people who aren't familiar, you know, with the rules of logic. You can still show people 
uh, you know, how, how utterly uh, flawed that conclusion uh, is. And in fact, uh, the idea, by the way, that, that, that humans should be considered information processors just because computers are information processors, that idea, I know, some days people are going to look back on it and think it was just preposterous. Yeah, it makes me think of the, the another syllogism. All, all monkeys climb trees, porcupines are monkeys, therefore porcupines climb trees. Yeah. I think the stickiness also has to do with the fact that that um, two fields have been advancing very rapidly. And this I did not really write about uh, in any detail at all. But the fact is two fields, it almost coincidentally, have been advancing very rapidly. One is computer science and the other is neuroscience. And, and, I, and I think that that's part of the problem, too. The fact that these two fields have grown so fast, more or less, uh, you know, uh, uh, simultaneously, you know, this has this has simply uh, been created opportunities for a lot of people uh, to employ this metaphor to start all kinds of uh, programs to get grant support, uh, and in some cases to to set up enormous programs involving hundreds of universities. So I think that's part of the problem as well. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. My, my last question, Robert. Uh, the the middle way, as we understand it, is the idea that we make. Uh, better judgments by avoiding fixed or dogmatic uh, beliefs about things. That then arguably throws us back onto experience. So we're left in this sort of messy, uncertain middle. But but it's in this messy, uncertain middle that we can actually perhaps start to get to grips more adequately with the phenomena that we encounter, whatever they are. How might this relate to what we've been talking uh, about today? Oh, it very much uh, relates because, and, and this is where some people have been, uh, uh, you know, a little dissatisfied with my with my essay, because I do end up in in, in a messy, uncertain middle, which I think is marvelous. I, I think that's where we should be. The messy, uncertain middle regarding the brain is to acknowledge that we really have no idea, uh, you know, how it works, at least uh, in regard to our, our intelligence. Uh, uh, you know, and we do know some interesting things and we're, you know, and there's a lot more we need to learn about and it's going to take us quite a while. In fact, some leading neuroscientists uh, whom I cite actually are suggesting it might take a hundred years or even hundreds of years to begin to understand, uh, how, how the brain makes us intelligent. And so that certainly puts us in a messy, uncertain middle. And I, I, I think we should cherish that. I think we should cherish it. I think we should cherish the messy, uncertain middle, uh, cherish the fact that we're organisms, cherish the fact that uh, we don't know everything, cherish the fact that some things are extremely hard to understand, uh, and then just go from there. Yeah, well, I'm, w I'm with you all the way there, Robert, and, uh, and thank you very much for a, a fascinating interview, and it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.